And today we are talking about the seventh commandment, which is, you shall not steal. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. Before we get to the Ten Commandments, I want to remind you that Pastor Jeremy Maddock is also covering the Ten Commandments in his podcast, Bible Breath. If you haven't heard Pastor Jeremy teach, you should know that he is incredibly gifted at taking really hard concepts and breaking them down into easy to understand bite-sized pieces. So it'll really add a lot to your study of the Ten Commandments if you listen to him. So just check out the episode notes and we'll put a link there to send you right on over. And just a reminder, if I haven't mentioned it for a couple of episodes, I am relying on Martin Luther's large catechism. That is where I'm getting all these insights that I'm sharing and gleaning with you. And if you haven't picked up your copy, I would definitely recommend it. As I've said in the past, I'm just giving you the highlights that I see as I've been reading these and studying them. You may pick up different insights. You may have other things hit you. It's much like reading the Bible. When I read the Bible on um, this certain day, this phrase or this verse really hits me as something that God is speaking to my heart. You could read the exact same phrase or section of scripture and something else hits you because God is speaking to you. It's a living, active word of God. And so... You know, with Luther's large catechism, if you buy your own copy and work your way through these commandments, you may have different insights. Different things may stick out to you and make you stop and think, or there might be other things that you can do, changes you can make, little little tweaks that you can make in your own life. And just to recap, why in the world should we care about the commandments? God doesn't give them to us because he's a mean, old heartless God in heaven and wants to have us live a dreary life. Just the opposite. God gives us these commandments because they are the path of blessing. When we obey his commandments, it is the best route. These are to help us avoid the pitfalls and the mistakes that would lead us into sin and into consequences that could really hurt our family or our marriage or our community standing or what have you. And they're also meant to help us be godly people to others. So they're meant to help the world see that God's children live differently and that God is watching out for us by giving us these commands to live by. So they're not meant to be a burden. They're meant to be a blessing. And once we establish that and realize that, why do we obey them? Not because we're forced to. We obey them out of thankfulness to God because it is one way that we can show our love for him for all the things that he's done for us. So with that in mind, we're going to head into the seventh commandment, which says you shall not steal. Now, most of us think of this as, you know, a burglar coming into your house or a shoplifter just blatantly taking things off the shelf at a store. But Luther said it is so much more than that. And again, when I was reading Luther's description of how we can live out the seventh commandment, I kept thinking to myself, you know, he was writing 500 years ago, but it very much feels like he was writing today. Not much has changed. And that's even what we read in the Bible. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. So what happened before keeps happening again. So how do we sin against this commandment? Well, we do it by not being a good employee for one thing. So when we're at work and we're lazy, when we're idle, when we're not doing our job, or when we're not doing our job to the best of our ability, that is stealing from our employer. Because we're on the clock, we're getting paid by them to do a job, but we're not taking our job seriously. Taking company things or using company things for our own benefit. So going to work and using the copier at work, 
you know, uses the paper that the company buys. It uses the ink that the company buys. If you do it with permission, it's one thing. But to just think, well, the company has lots of money and they won't miss 20 pages or, you know, they owe me because I work here. That's a totally different thing. Again, this isn't just for employment, though, because as I was going through this, I was thinking, this applies to me even as a Sunday school teacher. Because if I go to teach Sunday school, I don't get paid to teach Sunday school. But if I go to teach Sunday school and I don't prepare, so I just walk in totally cold, I haven't read the lesson. I haven't read commentaries. I haven't thought about it. I haven't prayed about it. I haven't asked for God for insights and examples. And I just walk into class. I'm really robbing the children of the opportunity to learn the word of God. I'm robbing them of their time because I don't have much to offer them. Everything that we do for the sake of someone else in terms of if we've been asked to do something or if we've committed to do something, we should do it to the best of our ability for the sake of the people that we are doing it for. So if you're getting paid for a job to do a job, and whether that's cat sitting or babysitting or actually where you go and punch in at work or volunteering, You should do it to the very best of your ability, giving credit to God and to bear witness to what he has done to you. So I bear the name of a Christian. Everybody at work knows that I'm a Christian. So if I go to work and I do my job sloppily, if I do it with a poor attitude, if they see me sitting around all the time, and not doing the things I'm supposed to do, I tarnish the name of Christ. Who wants to be a Christian if that's how Christians act? I want to be the best coworker that people have. So when I work, I want people to be thinking, I love working with her. I love when she works. I know she's going to do her job. I know she's going to go above and beyond. I know she's going to be gracious and kind. I know she's going to treat others with respect because I represent Christ when I walk through those doors. So Luther said, again, if you are an employee and you bring harm on your employer, instead of putting in an honest day's wage or work for the wage that you've been offered, you're really stealing from them. Luther also says that those people who provide a service in the community, so whether it's a mechanic, a workman, construction worker, painter, whatever, what have you. They offer a service. And when people come to them, if they charge exorbitant prices, they're stealing from people. They know that's not what it costs. They know that to perform that function in the community or whatever, a fair wage would be X, Y, or Z. And yet they are charging infinitely more And Luther says that's stealing. That's really robbing people for their own sake. He also talks about those businessmen who own large companies and how they make their products, again, with super high prices. He said the, the men who sit at home and dream of ways to make money off of people are really robbing communities. And, you know, it's so easy to become sinister, right? And think that all these big companies, whatever they are, you know, I'm not going to name them off, but all the big companies, they're just out to get us. They don't, they profit off of people. They don't have our best interest in mind. But one of the things that Luther said that should bring us comfort is these people and the ways that they work doesn't escape God. He sees when they take advantage of the little guy and God will take care of us, 
even if they are working their hardest to rip us off. So that should give us a lot of comfort to know God sees. So yeah, whether it's the gas companies that charge way too much or the grocery stores or the food producers or whoever, you know, look, complaining doesn't do any good. And this is what I have told so many people because for the last, you know, year, year and a half, whatever, we've had pretty decent inflation rates, right? And we can get really, you know, out of sorts about how crazy the prices are. Or we can just choose to say, God promises to provide our daily bread. So you know what? Yep, eggs might cost a little more right now, but I'm not going to worry about it because I still have enough money in my bank account to buy eggs. So it is what it is. I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to depend on God for my daily bread. And then I'm going to leave the rest to him. And again, Luther really comforts us in, in saying that if if these men who sit in their houses and dream of ways to steal from the common man get away with what they're doing, God sees. Now, I want to talk about one other way that we can steal. And Luther didn't bring this up, but when, when I was reading his chapter, I couldn't help but think of the passage from Malachi 3. I'm going to read it for you. It begins at verse 8, and I'm going to read through 10. God said this, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? How can we rob God? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Some of us need this reminder. I was recently doing a behind the series with Pastor Mike, and he mentioned that In America, we have so much, and yet the vast majority of people who sit in churches do not ever give an offering at church. That tells something about the condition of our heart. A, we're saying everything that I get should be mine, and B, we're not trusting God. And C, we're not showing our thanks for all that he has done for us. If you think about how much God has done for us, what are you lacking? Do you have clothes in your closet? Do you have food in your fridge? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you know that you are forgiven of your sins? Do you know the great sacrifice that Jesus did to make peace with God so you could go to heaven? God has made his word available to us. So back in Luther's day, that was unheard of. The Bibles were chained in the library. They were written in Latin, I think it was. And so the common person wasn't able to have access to the word. They couldn't read the word of God. We have the word of God easily at our disposal. All of us have access to it. Not just the Bibles that we have in our house, but through apps. I have a Bible app where I can be in my car driving to work and someone is reading the word of God to me. I am able to listen to Pastor Mike's sermons or CL Whiteside's podcast or or Bruce Becker's podcasts on my way to work so that I have people speaking into me truths from the word of God. We have been given so much And this is what God is trying to get us to realize. And this is what I have learned in my own life. And I think if you just give it a chance, you will see the same thing too. Every time that I've given to God, so the way I do it in my family, Steve and I, at the beginning of the year, we um, 
we decide what we're giving to church. So we just have it automatically taken out of our account. So we give electronically, right? But then all throughout the year, we also give to, you know, Time of Grace and some other ministries that are really important to our heart. And some of those are automatic and some of those we do as the spirit moves us or as there's a need or sometimes when there's a drive of funds, you know, raising uh, raising funds for certain things or what have you. But the point is we make giving to God a priority. So we do it electronically. So it's not something that we have to write out a check every week. But we know our money is going to support the work of the church, right? Because that's important to us. And this is this is what the point that I'm trying to make is that we do not miss that money. When you give to God, I don't know anybody. I cannot say one person that I know that has ever said to me, I don't have enough to eat because I gave all my money to the church or, well, I gave an offering, but there wasn't money for the house payment this month. It's not like that. Every time I've given to the Lord and every time I've given to God's people, I've never missed it. There are many, many times that I have regret missing the opportunities to do things for God's people. So when I have seen a need, and I've kind of gone, uh, I'm not going to give this time or mm, maybe not. And I, I shirk away from that many times in the following days or weeks. I think, why did I hesitate? Why, why didn't I give to that? Or why didn't I help that person in that situation? That's where the regret has come in. Never, ever have I written a check or donated money to whatever of God's people, whatever ministry, and in the days, weeks, or months later gone, hmm, probably shouldn't have done that. Never once. Can't think of one time in 27 years of marriage that that's occurred. And that should be inspiration for you. God says, test me in this. And you know, throughout the Bible, he doesn't tell us to test him in anything else. He doesn't say, test me and see if you can trust me. You know, raise your hand and shake your hand against me and say, God, if you don't work things out this way, he doesn't say that. But when it comes to giving to God, he says we rob him if we're not giving to him. And that should really make us sit up and and take this seriously. That we're stealing from God if we are not giving to his kingdom work. Okay, point made. (laughs) Luther ends this part of the catechism uh, by saying, look, there's there's a positive and a negative to every commandment. So when Luther says the commandments that God gave to Moses, he does that. He explains it and he says, don't do this. But then he also says, this is what you should do instead. And what he says for the positive reinforcement, what we should be doing is making sure that our neighbors are able to keep their possessions. This is really about treating people fairly, not overcharging them. Look, God will provide for you. And he sees when you put in an honest day's work and the paycheck that you get and you think, okay, I have this need coming up and I don't know how to make it happen He sees that. He knows. You could swindle people, but you're not. You're doing it honestly. Just go to God with your your needs and see how he doesn't work it out. I just had a conversation with a friend two days ago. We were sitting down for supper. It's a friend I don't get to see very often. She lives in a different state. And I, I went and was able to spend some time with her. And we were marveling at the different times in our life that a need has come up, a legitimate need, you know, not not a frivolous one. And how we have gone to God and said, I'm not sure how to make this work, or this is what's coming up. And I know that this is going to be X amount of money. And, you know, I don't know what to do about this. And the ways that God has worked it out, 
things that we would have never expected. Sometimes it, it happens as a job that he gives to us, a, an extra job for both of us that happen at different points in our life. Um, I needed to pay more for tuition for my kids to go to a private school. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And God gave me a job. And at the end of the year, when I looked at how much I had made, it was exactly the amount that the tuition was for my kids. It was crazy. And this friend had a similar situation where she had something that she presented to God. And she's like, I'd like to do this, but um, I'm going to need the money. And this job came along that she could do. And it was exactly what she needed at exactly the right time. So when we do things honestly, and when we really legitimately have a need, instead of looking for a way to swindle someone, or instead of going and buying a lottery ticket and putting your hope there, it's a much better thing to go to God, present your request, present your need. He's your heavenly father. If you don't have kids, I wish that you could see my husband when my children come to them for him for anything. We ended up buying a snowmobile this year. I bought a snowmobile. I didn't really want to buy a snowmobile. But my husband can't say no to my children. When my children come to him and say, Dad, I would love to have this so we could all go snowmobiling together, my husband just melts and has a hard time saying no. And then he gets his wife in the car and takes her along. And the next thing I know, I'm writing out a check for a snowmobile that I didn't even think I wanted or needed. And that's to say, my husband has a terrible time saying no to his children who he loves. And your heavenly father, when you go to him and say, God, help me out here. He loves to lavish his children with blessing. And a snowmobile is a frivolous thing. When you have a legitimate need, how much more does your Heavenly Father want to lavish those blessings on you? Something to think about. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.